I think it's pretty easy to state that a compelling part of any great hex-based strategy game is exploration. The sense of mystery and curiosity that you have in the opening moments of a game like Civ is a key part of the genre. The player will often start with a single character or unit, and be surrounded by darkness, fog, or some other kind of stylized masking of the map, with one main goal. Explore. And because the maps are often precisely generated, each new playthrough invokes a new sense of wonder, as you'll have no idea what you may uncover nearby. Gradually, you'll be revealing the map, discovering new points of interest or resources as you explore, and the greater depth of the gameplay will start to kick in. While these opening moments are often brief in terms of the scope of the full game at hand, there's often a lot that goes into designing the start of a strategy game like Civ, Humankind, or other games of this ilk. From procedural map generation, to hex-based navigation, and then, of course, the infamous Fog of War. Each of these components are the framework for any good strategy game. So today, why don't we take a look at how we can build out our own strategy game starter pack. Hi there, I'm Matt, and welcome to Game Dev Guide. In this episode, we're going to take a look at how we can generate a hex map with different tile types, how we can navigate it with A-star pathfinding, and how we can add the sense of mystery by creating our own fog of war effect and reveal tiles as we move around the map. First though, I'd like to take a quick second to thank the sponsor of this video, Outstandly. As you all know, first impressions are everything, especially when it comes to games. Your average player will often be judging a game on its visuals alone, so it's important to have good high quality art assets in order to make a great first impression. And this is where Outstandly come in. Outstandly are an art outsourcing studio who want to work with you and your game or team. You may or may not know that outsourcing is a common practice within the industry and is an incredibly valuable way for a studio or team to deliver their work on budget and on schedule. Outstandly are a team of versatile and experienced artists willing to work with you on whatever your project desires. So whether your game needs pixel art, slick looking UI, or stylized 3D characters complete with a rig, they have a wide network of artists available to meet the demands of your project. During the process, Outstandly will update you with their progress and you'll be able to comment on updates, approve or disapprove of deliveries, and review different versions of assets to ensure that you're getting the best quality results for your project. So if your team is struggling to get all of the art done for your game on schedule, or if you just want someone else to focus on making your game look good so you can focus on development, then consider clicking the link below and getting in touch with Outstandly. And be sure to let them know that Game Dev Guide sent you, as they're offering all viewers of the channel a bonus when giving a quote. The bonus will scale depending on the size of your order, so the more you need from them, the better an offer they'll be able to give you. Now, let's go ahead and get started. Earlier this year, I made a video about procedurally generating a hex tile and laying multiple procedural tiles out into a grid. It's the foundation of some of the ideas discussed in this video, and I'll be skimming over a lot of the concepts I've already discussed there, so definitely check it out first if you haven't watched it already. For the purposes of this video, I've moved away from the procedural mesh generation and put together a few different hex assets in Blender. These are going to be the basis of our hex map. With each playthrough of the game, I'd like the map to be different, so we're going to need a way to procedurally generate a map. One option would be to randomly place every single tile on the map and run through a list of rules during placement to make sure it looks good, however I feel like there's a lot of overhead on the engineering side to get that right. So instead of placing tiles individually, we're going to pre-bake a variety of different chunks of tiles and then use those chunks to generate our final map making it far, far simpler to get good looking results with less effort focused on rule-based engineering. There's a few ways we could go about building out the chunks. I could run the map generator a few times to just lay out tiles randomly until I get something I like, or I could just manually put the whole thing together, but I kind of want to work smarter, not harder, and get the best of both worlds. So we'll load some work up front and build out a few little helpers that will allow me to build chunks super easily and define my map generation tools. What I basically want to do is be able to roll a chunk randomly and then go in and tweak it to my liking in the inspector. So in order to do this, we'll need to store a little bit of information about our tiles that our map generator can use. I'll start by putting together a scriptable object that will hold all the information about our different tile types and then have it be able to return a prefab based on each of these tile types. We'll set it up and make sure that our generator script has access to it. In the layout method of the generator script, we'll spawn a new game object and add a hex tile component. This hex tile component is going to hold a reference to its own tile type. When we set it up, we'll give it a reference to the settings. Next, we'll randomly assign a tile type to this tile, and then we'll instance the prefab based on the tile type. We'll also add in some editor-based logic that tells our tile to update if anything on our tile's property changes. 
Then if we spawn some tiles and select one of them, when we change the tile type, our asset actually updates. Before we go through and design our chunks though, we also want to set up some coordinate logic for navigation later. So let's assign the offset coordinate to our tile when it's generated, and then we'll convert that into a cube coordinate. For more information on cube coordinates and to just generally get a better understanding of hex-based stuff in general, be sure to check out this excellent interactive guide from Red Blob Games. It goes into tons of depth brilliantly, so I won't really cover it here in the video. I've made another little utility function to do our conversion from our even offset coordinates into cube coordinates, which we'll use here. Now we can go through and design our chunks, saving them out as prefabs when we're happy with them. With our chunks set up, we can now lay out our map. To do this, we can basically use the same utility that we're using to lay out our tiles and just scale it up to our chunks. So I've moved that method into its own little utilities class, and we can now call upon it from both of our layout scripts. So for our map generator, we'll just assign a map size, grab a random chunk, and then input the chunk size as the offset when setting our position. Now we can run through our map generator a few times and make sure things look okay with our chunks. If there are any issues, we can open up the chunks prefab and make any of the necessary changes that we like. I hope you can see that even just by scaling up from randomly generating all of the tiles into these chunks, we get a lot more control over how our hex map looks. Depending on the desired outcome, you'll probably want to add in some extra rules defining how each chunk can fit together to get a more cohesive look for your map, but that's out of scope for this video. I'm pretty happy with the results that we're getting for now. Okay, so with our map generating, let's navigate it. When we spawn a chunk, we also need to offset each tile's coordinates by the position of this chunk, and then update the cube coordinates accordingly. With our coordinates set up, we're going to have a much easier time building out our navigation system. The first thing we need to do is build out our navigation nodes. We'll create a script to manage our tiles on the map generator, and in here, we'll get a reference to all of the tiles in the transform and register its coordinates into a dictionary. We'll then go through each tile and calculate out a list of its neighbors. This is where our cube coordinate system comes in handy. We can simply define a list of the six neighboring cube coordinates and then check our dictionary to see if those exist. And if the tile exists, we can just add it as a neighbor of our current tile. I really like giving each tile a local list of its neighbors because we're essentially caching them. When we start working on our navigation code, we can very easily step through each tile's neighbor and figure out a path to our location. More on that in a bit. I've added a little code in the onGizmos method so that we can check our working. We now get a lovely grid of nodes in our scene view and lines connecting them all up to one another. Perfect. In order to pick a tile to move into, we're going to need to be able to select it. So I've added a raycasting script onto my camera that shoots a raycast out into the world. If it hits a tile, it will call the corresponding method on the tile. If I were doing this on a larger scale, I'd have the camera use a custom interface so it can manage anything implementing that interface for selection, but for the purposes of this demo, we're just gonna handle each tile, so it's fine. From there, our tile then handles what to do when it's hit by the raycast, and in this case, it just tells our tile manager script that it's been chosen, and it's up to our tile manager to handle the rest. So, when a tile tells our manager it's highlighted, I'm just moving this little highlight object around for now, and when clicked, another game object gets set as its position to show that as the selected tile. We can now visibly select a target tile, which is great, but in order to pathfind, we need an origin. So let's create a little player object and designate them a location somewhere in our tile manager. Okay, now we have a player object in the scene. We're ready to pathfind from our player tile to our selected tile. We just need to build out our actual pathfinding algorithm. I'm going to assume many of you here are pretty familiar with how A-star pathfinding works, so I'll be glossing over the basics here. However, if you're totally unfamiliar with A-star pathfinding, I'll leave some links in the description below for further reading and help you get up to speed. I've created a new class called Pathfinder to handle a pathfinding call and created a public static method called FindPath. This takes an origin tile and a destination tile and expects to return a list of hex tiles as our path. Our hex tiles are gonna need something we can use to evaluate and store costs. So I always like to make a little utility class called Node. In our constructor, we'll pass in the target tile, as well as our origin and destination. We'll then also pass in our current path cost up to this point. We'll assign everything and then set our costs by calculating the distance between our various coordinates. We'll also create a getCost method that will just return the total value of all of the various costs. And then we'll add a setParent method that allows us to assign another node as this node's parent for when we want to traverse back through our path. And that's pretty much it for our node utility. 
As you know, A star is all about our node evaluation, so back in our find path method, we'll start by making two dictionaries, one for our unevaluated nodes and one for our evaluated nodes. We'll then create a starting node from our origin point and add it to our unevaluated dictionary. From this point, we'll simply have to evaluate our nodes and when a path is found, return said path. The evaluate next node method handles the individual evaluation of each node and our evaluated lists. It will also handle the output of our path once our path is found. When evaluating a node, we first need to pick the cheapest neighbor to evaluate next. This get cheapest node method just takes our unevaluated nodes and finds the one with the lowest cost. Once we've selected our node, we'll remove it from our unevaluated list and add it to our evaluated list. If this node is our destination, then our path is complete, so we can build out our path and return true. Otherwise, we need to check each of our current tile's neighbors and figure out if they're a low cost option worth traversing, or if the target tile isn't already in our unevaluated list. And so with a little debug script here, let's just draw our path out. When we select a tile on our map in the scene view, we can see our path is getting created. If we click on different tiles, our path updates. Awesome. Let's convert this into something we can see in our game view, shall we? We'll pass our path points into a line renderer. Now, whenever we select a new path, our renderer will update and show us the way to our tile. All we need to do now is have our player make their way to each of the tiles, and as we move from point to point, we'll update our line renderer. And just for a little bit of fun, I've added some enemies to our map. They will start at a random point and pick a random tile on the map to move to. I've timed out the movement code into a tick, so now every second it will call the movement script on all of our entities in the world and keep them all moving together. The fun thing about this is that the player can stand still and everyone else will keep moving. By moving this to a tick system and waiting for a method to be called, we have a lot of control over our game's timing. Right now we're a real-time strategy game where the game ticks every second, but we could just as easily convert this into a turn-based system by having a button call that tick method instead. So it actually affords us a lot of flexibility to control everyone's movement on a single tick like this. Anyway, I've also added a game over state, so when an enemy runs into the same tile the player is on, we stop the ticks and show this little you got caught screen. So that's the gist of our navigation. We've done a lot in this video so far, and we've almost achieved our goal of recreating the classic strategy game starting point, but we've got one final ingredient to go in order to really add spice and flavor to our strategy game soup. So there are a number of different ways that games choose to implement Fog of War, and it's totally going to depend on the architecture of your game and its design. But having experimented with a few different styles, my preferred method is an in-world geometric solution. The core concept with this method is that we only show tiles that the player has explored, and any other tile in the game yet to be explored is invisible, and instead replaced with a basic hex that obscures whatever is supposed to be underneath it. It's a little more expensive than some other Fog of War solutions, but it's definitely one of the easiest and fastest to manage. I experimented with a few different techniques for this, the simplest of which works just fine and is practical, but I also found a fun hack to make it look even better with some relatively simple shader magic, which I think some of you will enjoy. For now, let's just start with our basic practical solution and get things working. We'll grab one of our tiles, scale it up a bit, and give it a full black material, and then save this as a prefab. In our hex manager, when we add our hex tiles, we'll also call a method to instance our fog of war tile on the map, placing it in the same position as the hex. We'll then link the fog of war tile to this hex, as we'll need a reference to it when revealing the tile and hiding the fog. Now we could disable the tile, but we still need to be able to pathfind into the fog. So what we'll do instead is add a new layer called hidden that our camera won't render and put anything hidden behind the fog on this layer. We'll send the game object for our hex tile to this layer when generating our fog as we don't want it to be visible. Now my map is covered in fog. Cool. We should probably be able to see the tile our player is on though. So let's make sure that when they're placed, we reveal the selected tile and also reveal the neighboring tile so that there's a small field of vision. The reveal method on the tile will simply turn off the fog of war object and then tail the tile to enable itself. Now, when we start the game, the small area around our player is visible. When we move through our map, we probably want to be revealing more tiles. So let's take care of that real quick by telling the tile to reveal when we move to it. Okay, now as we move around, we're revealing tiles. But right now we can still see our enemies, so let's also hide them unless they're on a tile currently revealed by the player.
and with that small adjustment, our little demo here just got so much more compelling. Seeing enemies just seemingly appear on tiles I've revealed and then disappear again as they keep moving around is an incredibly powerful mechanic that adds so much tension to this experience. As I'm sure you'll agree, this blacked out tile technique for the Fog of War definitely does the job. It's practical and just using a block system like this serves this purpose in a pretty cheap way. So it's absolutely something I wanted to show you. However, I really didn't want to end the video on this bargain bin style Fog of War. I wanted to give it some artistic love and find something more visually interesting. You see, one of the issues I have with this is that it's very obviously tied to the hex grid. Edges are sharp and it's just generally very blocky. So I tried a few different examples using a world space shader on the geometry and some vertex displacement, which definitely creates an interesting and more uniform look, but I wasn't a big fan of how it messed with the edges. So I then tried a couple of attempts at using some flat hex geometry instead to see how that looked, but I couldn't really get anything that I was happy with. I really wanted to see if I could create something more cloudy and fog-like, but I was worried I was going to have to jump into Shaderland and write some complex volumetric cloud stuff and just absolutely blow the scope of this video. I booted up Civ 5 and looked real close. These didn't look volumetric, parts of them kept appearing and disappearing, which to me looked like... Wait, are those... are those particles? What if it was a particle sim? Unity's built-in particle system allows for a mesh as the source for particles. So with a little shader magic and a lot of experimentation, we can create these cloud particles which when rendered on each tile, all scale up to look like volumetric clouds. Or, well, fog. A true fog of war effect with very little effort. So most of the magic here is just the particle system itself. We can simply grab a single tile and add a particle system to it. And while you could probably get away with just using a sphere shape, I wanted proper coverage of my tile, so we'll set the shape to a mesh renderer and use our hex, remembering to disable the renderer itself. As you can see, with a little finessing of the particle settings, even with the default Unity particle, it looks pretty decent, so you can very easily play around just to get your desired results. For me though, I wanted to see if I could recreate the cloud-like effect from Civ and have a consistent look across the entire size of the map. So while I could have probably just used some textured particle or something, I figured some shader magic would definitely help me fine tune the effect I needed. I'm using built in here, so we'll open up the Amplify Shader Editor and get to work. We'll make a new shader set to Legacy Particles, and basically this effect is achieved just by primarily generating noise textures and adding them together. But first we'll need our particle shape. By default we're just working with a quad and I want a nice round circle gradient that we can add that noise to. So let's grab our vertex coordinates and offset them by 0.5. We'll then multiply the results by two. We'll then get the dot product and square root the result. As you can see, this gives us a nice edge that we can work with. But we need a round circle, so let's drag this into a one minus node. Then we'll pass this into a smooth step node. And now we have a circle that we can start working from. Let's add some noise to this. We'll generate some 3D noise from the world position and offset it over time. We'll then pass this into a lerp node and use two color properties to define the look of our noise. Then we'll split the result and combine that with our other nodes, passing the circle effect into our alpha port as a mask. Now we have some already pretty effective clouds, and because the noise is 3D and mapped to world position, it has this volumetric-like projection. Finally, I'd just like to mask the edges of our particles off a bit and make them a little bit more wispy. So we'll add some more noise and offset it again, this time adjusting the scale to be more granular. We'll then invert our particle shape and use a multiply node to soften or tighten up the edge of the radius. Then we'll multiply that with our noise and subtract the result from our main particle, and this will give us a solid particle center with masked noisy edges. And then we'll just pass that through a clamp node to clean it up. We'll also multiply that result by the vertex alpha so that any alpha effects from the particle system are rendered by our shader and return the final result. Now we have a wispy volume-like particle shader. I really like this technique the most because while yes, it may be slightly more expensive than just a physical tile, unfortunately Unity's particle system is pretty CPU hungry, doing this with particles adds so much more to the look and feel of our fog, and we can really experiment with different particle effects to hone in our look. I really love how it gives that visual shape around the edges, rather than just geometry, we now have this wispiness to the edge of our revealed tiles that we couldn't really achieve before. And there we have it, we now have our complete starter pack for our strategy game. We're randomly generating a map using hex chunks, able to navigate around these tiles, and then reveal portions of the map as we explore. 
That's about it for this video. It is very much a stepping stone into a much more complex game genre, but hopefully you found some of it useful and have a clearer idea of how to get started building out hex map gameplay. If you've enjoyed the video, be sure to hit that thumbs up button and let me know what your thoughts are down in the comments below. Thanks again to Outstandly for sponsoring the video. To order some great personalized art assets for your game, be sure to get in touch with them using the link below. And don't forget to tell them that I sent you for that bonus. If you're new to the channel, please do consider hitting that subscribe button as you'll get to know when new videos from me go live. Or if you'd like to see more from me first, consider checking out the recommended video on screen now. As always, thank you very much for watching and I will see you again next time.